Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. Our plant today is not a plant. It's yeast. Latin name Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I spoke about this one-celled member of the fungi kingdom with Dr. Ian Roberts of the NCYC, or National Collection of Yeast Cultures. The NCYC is the UK's premier collection of yeast cultures and holds over 4,000 strains of yeast collected over 65 years. Dr. Ian Roberts is the curator of this collection. Welcome to the show, Ian. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. How does someone, how did you actually become a yeast curator? Well, I started off as a biologist. So so my degree is in biology um, a long time ago. I spent um, maybe about 10 years working on plants and then another 10 years working on filamentous fungi. And uh, for the last 15, 20 years, I've been working on yeasts. Can you actually see what you're curating? (laughs) Um, Under the microscope, yes, you can. (laughs) And so one thing that I thought was really interesting is the yeast is so tiny, it's microscopic. The collection is quite large. It's over 4,000 strains. How how big is the actual collection? Is it a whole building or? <laughs> it, um, so we have a number of ways of preserving the yeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first and, and the, the master stock, if you like, is under liquid nitrogen. And the um, liquid nitrogen container, which contains the 4,000 yeasts, is really no bigger than a domestic freezer. Oh my gosh, that is mind-boggling. <laughs> <laughs> and so can you tell, for people who are thinking like, okay, a show on yeast, what exactly is yeast? Is it a plant? Um, no, it's a fungus. So it's in, the fun- it's in the fungi or fungi family. And how many species of yeast are there? Currently, we, we recognize about 1,500 different species of um, yeasts, as, as, as well, mostly as predominantly um, single-celled fungi. That's, that's how we classify them. Um, but it's been estimated that there could be as many as 10 times that still to be isolated. And does yeast share with other species um, of plants and animals on the planet right now? Are there endangered yeast or are yeast disappearing at a rapid rate? Uh, I guess they must be because they, they're very much part of the microbial flora that is associated with um, insects and plants. We, we think they sort of evolve at the interface between plants and insects. And uh, as, as plants and insects disappear, then, of course, the yeast must go with them. And where would we find yeast around um, the globe? Absolutely everywhere. There's, there's almost no environment. Well, I, I do not know of any environment where you can't find them. And for example, we have yeasts from the Arctic Circle, uh, from Antarctica, from um, the rainforests, uh, equatorial rainforests, uh, the, the Maritime Alps in France. Uh, um, or, or basically, any, anywhere you look for yeast, there's a very high probability that you'll isolate, isolate them. They're, they're on our skin all the time. Wow, that's so interesting. Are they at all like um, the bacteria in our guts, or do they need oxygen to survive? Yeah, they, they do need a small amount of oxygen. I mean, they can grow anaerobically, but um, to, to, normally we, we grow them in, in aerobic um, cultures. How bi- How large are they, or should I say small? <laughs> well, so, we, um, so they're, they're just microns across. Um, you know, we, you could get thousands on, on the head of a pin. What is yeast's role in the ecosystem? Like, what does it do in the environment? I guess it would depend on what type of yeast. Yes, we, well, we, we think it's um, part of nature's recycling. It, it's certainly able to live in a number of different environments. It can scavenge from very low nutrient conditions. Uh, it can form a food source for beetles and uh, just generally recycle nutrients from rotting fruit or um, in, in tree bark. That's funny enough, the, the, the baking yeast, one of the best places to isolate it from 
is from the uh, oak tree bark. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't seem logical to me, but that's so interesting. And you know how certain fungi like mycelium and bacteria have a symbiotic relationship with plants and plant roots? Do you think see any yeast that have that relationship with plants? Uh, I th- I'm not aware of any, but I think they must do simply because because there's there's some evidence that um, they act as um, stabilizers of of microbial communities. So it may not be the same yeast species, but it, that, but yeast clearly play a role in in a sustainable um, microbial culture. Could you share with our listeners who actually discovered yeast? I think you'd have to credit the ancient Egyptians. And that's based on Sumerian hieroglyphics about 5,000 years old. Uh, but it's very likely that you know, even before agriculture, humans were actually using um, yeasts. We, th- we think the modern yeasts arose about the same time as the flowering plants, which would be about 100 million years ago. Wow. And so it sounds like we've been in relationship with yeast for a really long time using yeast. What does yeast need? And then I'd love to get more into how we're using yeast. What does yeast need to survive and to thrive? Uh, It needs sugar. And if you give it sugar, it will make gas. And that's why the Egyptians were using it in baking. And if you give it sugar, it will also make alcohol, which we think is important for its survival in, in, in in an environment where there's lots of rotting fruit and bacterial competition. But but also obviously from from perspective of human brewing, um, that's that's why we need yeasts. We use yeast for fermentation and to in baking and in brew, brewing. Um, what exactly is the process when fermentation is occurring? Could you share with our listeners what's happening? Well, essentially the the yeast is um, growing, but once it starts to lose the ox- its oxygen supply because it's growing in, in you know in, in a um, in a bread dough or in, or in a um, brewing wort, uh, it starts to produce alcohol. So it starts to essentially not make um, more cells, but to, to, but to use it existing powers to make uh, alcohol and gas. Would you say then, Ian, that we have actually domesticated certain strains of yeast? Well, well that's certainly what we used to think. And, and there's, there's been some recent work that suggests that the, the lager yeast was actually in existence 2,000 years ago in China, and it appears to have travelled to, down to Europe by the Silk Road, whereupon it was isolated by the, the lager brewers and you know, Pasteur in 1883. What would you guess, Ian, um, and you alluded to it a bit earlier, but how do you think yeast, so it's in rotting fruit on the ground, do you think that maybe that's how we discovered um, its fermentation I, I think that the most likely thing is that um, somebody left some bread dough out and some yeast from the environment got into it, whether that was from a, you know, a previous brew or from um, you know, just mixing some beer with the, with the bread or whatever, I don't know. But I, and obviously if, the, if that causes the dough to rise, then you get a, a nicer texture, possibly a better taste with the bread. So um, yeah, I, I imagine it's a complete um, happy accident. Could you tell us a bit about a few of the interest, more interesting strains that you have collected there? Yes, I, it, the collection started in 1948 um, as, as a group of brewers getting together um, to preserve the source of their wealth effectively. They, they knew that yeast was very important to, to their business. Um, they knew that they were using different kinds of yeast for different beers and they wanted to keep a backup stock altogether. So it, so it starts off as a, um, a safe backup store of so if anything goes wrong in the brewery a flood or a fire or, or whatever they can come back get their yeast in pristine condition and uh, get up and running again as soon as possible and so it's almost like a seed bank in a way yeah it, it's a, it's a heritage collection of, of all the yeasts that have ever been used in U, uk brewing and what are some of the oldest strains there the the oldest strains we have were from the 1920s so so although the collection didn't start for another 20 years or so they were um recorded at some by somebody at some point as being isolated in the 1920s so do you have you have yeast for brewing do you have other kinds of yeast there as well yeah the the collection um moved from the brewing foundation to the institute of food research in norwich in 1981 and Part of the reasoning behind that was that there was more interest in, in a wider variety of yeasts than just the brewing yeasts. 
So we started adding a few baking strains, um, strains that were turning up in in food spoilage situations, um, as, a, as a sort of reference collection. So if some if a particular yogurt or um, fruit puree was boiled, we could actually try to figure out exactly which species was causing the problem. And I could see how yeast is very valuable then for these food and beer manufacturers. Absolutely, it's the basis of, of their wealth, and uh, and also increasingly, it's also a source of variety for them. So um, we had there's examples of uh, breweries that um, closed down in the 1950s and 1960s, and uh, starting up again in in the last couple of years. And of course, we still have their yeast frozen and are able to provide it to them, so it gives them a link to the past. And is the frozen yeast, is it kind of in suspended animation? Do you have to feed it to keep it alive, or is it just frozen? No, they're, they're really tough. So you, you preserve them in a certain way, so you you, you freeze them quite quickly um, in a way that they do, doesn't disrupt the cell. And they come back um, whenever you want them in, in ex- with exactly the same brewing characteristics as, with, as when they were put down. Wow, I wish we could do that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably quite useful. I'm going to sleep for a year and then wait. <laughs> um, how long does yeast live? Uh, the, an individual cell probably buds. The, the short answer is I'm, it's really a question of what you mean by how long does it live. The, 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 the sort of a mother-daughter relationship, and it, that causes the yeast culture to double every three hours or so. And obviously it does get tired and you do have to then refresh the culture. But the, the it's a clonal population, so you can keep that going for indefinitely, really. Could you share with listeners what indigenous yeast is? It's a great idea. I mean, indigenous yeast would make sense in terms of a local environment. So, so if, if we're talking about localism, then we would expect different populations to exist in, in different localities just not not vastly different but but slightly different and one of the things um we touched upon when we were talking about whether there was a domestication event that led from the sort of wild yeasts which you probably want to wouldn't want to brew or bake with to the yeast that we have, have sort of domesticated for it, for brewing and baking uh it looks from our genome sequence analysis that that didn't actually happen what appears to have happened is that um, rather than domesticating a single line, uh, a single lineage, uh, evolutionary lineage, if you like, we have moved different populations around the world, enabled them to sort of mix and breed and release diversity that wouldn't have got released in a particular um, environment otherwise. So it's quite a fascinating and, and complicated picture. But humans, have, and it just goes to show what, how tight the relationship between humans and yeast is because as humans have moved around the world, they've mixed their yeasts and, and uh, released a whole new, of, of a very interesting uh, biological species. And so how would, say that um, someone wanted to save a yeast that they love and they're using, how would the yeast end up in your collection? Well, the, the first thing they have to do is, is send it to us. Uh, we will then check it out um, perform a number of tests so that we can differentiate it from all the other yeasts in the collection and at some point that will then be given an NCYC number and be made available to anybody who wants it. And is there anything else you want to share with listeners about the collection? Uh, I think really it's, it's just a, a very valuable resource that can be used in a number of different ways and uh, particularly in the future as we learn more about the genomes and and the capabilities of the yeast, uh, we think it can be used in in ways other than just brewing and baking. And you mentioned they're kind of like nature's bio-recyclers or recyclers. So it sounds like one application of yeast in the future may be recycling biomass. Yeah, and I think that's already happening to some extent. Uh, We we already have a um, a biorefinery operation where we're able to screen the collection for for novel traits that enable us to convert um, different biomasses in in a sort of um, in an efficient way. Would you say in general that yeast, and I guess it just depends on what kind of yeast, has had a beneficial impact on on human culture and humans, or detrimental, or both? I guess both. I mean, obviously, um, 
alcohol is is very beneficial <laughs> in some in some circumstances and and less beneficial in in excess uh, I think. um but uh, overall uh, when when you think about it uh, there there have been periods in human history when the only safe drinking water was because it had got some alcohol that the yeast had put into it which had kept the bacteria out so so i think it, i think it's very important to understand that yeast has enabled us to drink safely as long as the alcohol is not too strong of course and i didn't know that really the fermentation when the yeast is fermenting it's very sterile yes yeah that's that's right it's 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 safe to drink a very weak beer because it's um keeping dangerous bacteria out could you share with listeners how they can find you online and also a bit about your catalog and i think you also have courses too we're certainly very interested in um talking to people about running courses and we're very interested in making our yeast collection more widely available and, and all the information that we have alongside it. The best point of contact is the www.ncyc.co.uk website and that gives all the information about our collection and um, where we can answer questions or offer courses that people may be interested in. And is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd want to share with people today? Uh, I can't think of anything immediately. I've certainly, um, I think I've given you pretty much <laughs> all I know. I only have 800 questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I think the, the, yeah, the, the message is, well, well the, what I'm trying to get across is, is that these um, genome sequences and uh, yeast collections that go with them are a really important resource and, and a, a repository of useful activities for the future. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure to speak with you today. It's my pleasure. Great speaking to you. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report. The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.